The Parlor Car Ghost All draped with blue denim, the seaside cottage of my friend, Sarah Pine. She asked me to go there with her when she opened to have it set in order for the summer. She confessed she felt a trifle nervous at the idea of entering it alone. And I'm always ready for an excursion. So much blue denim rather surprised me, because blue is not complimentary to Sarah's complexion. She always wears some shade of red by preference. She perceived my wonder. She is very nearsighted and therefore sees everything by some sort of sixth sense. You do not like my portieres and curtains and table covers, she said. Neither do I, but I did it to accommodate. And now he rests well in his grave, I hope. Who's grave for pity's sake? Mr. J. Billington Prices. And who is he? He doesn't sound interesting. Then I will tell you about him, said Sarah, taking a seat directly in front of one of those curtains. Last autumn I was leaving this place for New York, traveling on the fast express train known as the Flying Yankee. Of course, I thought of the Flying Dutchman and Wagner's musical setting of the Ankeny legend and how different things are in these days of steam, etc. Then I looked out of the window at the landscape, the horizon that seemed to wheel in a great curve as the train sped on. Every now and then I had an impression at the tail of the eye that a man was sitting in a chair three or four numbers in front of me on the opposite side of the car. Each time that I saw this shape I looked at the chair and ascertained that it was unoccupied but it was an odd trick of vision. I raised my lorgnette, and the chair showed emptier than before. There was nobody in it, certainly. But the more I knew that it was vacant, the more plainly I saw the man, always with the corner of my eye. It made me nervous. When passengers entered the car, I dreaded lest they might take that seat. What would happen if they should? A bag was put in the chair, That made me uncomfortable. The bag was removed at the next station. Then a baby was placed in the seat. It began to laugh as though someone had gently tickled it. There was something odd about that chair. Thirteen was its number. When I looked away from it, the impression was strong upon me that some person sitting there was watching me. Really, it would not do to humor such fancies. So I touched the electric button, asked the porter to bring me a table, and taking from my bag a pack of cards, proceeded to divert myself with a game of patience. I was puzzling where to put a seven of spades. Where can it go? I murmured to myself. A voice behind me prompted, play the four of diamonds on the five, and you can do it. I started. The only occupants of the car besides me were a bridal couple, a mother with three little children, and a typical preacher of one of the straightest sex. Who had spoken? Play up the four, madam, repeated this voice. I looked fearfully over my shoulder. At first I saw a bluish cloud, like cigar smoke, but inodorous. Then the vision cleared, and I saw a young man whom I knew by a subtle intuition to be the occupant seen and not seen, of chair number 13. Evidently he was a traveling salesman and a ghost. Of course, a drummer's ghost sounds ridiculous. They're so extremely alive. Or else you would expect a dead drummer to be particularly dead and not walk. This was a most commonplace-looking ghost, cordial, pushing, businesslike. At the same time, his face had an expression of utter despair and horror, which made him still more preposterous. Of course it is not nice to let a stranger speak to one, even on so impersonal a topic as a four of diamonds. But a ghost, there can't be any rule of etiquette about talking with a ghost. My dear, it was dreadful. That forward creature showed me how to play all the cards, and then begged me to lay them out again, in order that he might give me some clever points. I was too much amazed and disturbed to speak. I could only place the cards at his suggestion. This I did so as not to appear to be listening to the empty air, and be supposed to be a crazy woman. Presently the ghost spoke again and told me his story. Madam, he said, I have been riding back and forth on this car ever since February 22, 1890. 
seven months and eleven days. All this time I have not exchanged a word with anyone. For a drummer, it's pretty hard, you may believe. You know the story of the Flying Dutchman? Well, that is very nearly my case. A curse is upon me and will not be removed until some kind soul. But I'm getting ahead of my text. That day there were four of us, traveling for different houses. One of the boys was in wool, one in baking powder, one in boots and shoes, and myself in cotton goods. We met on the road, took seats together, and fell into talking shop. Those fellows told big lies about their sales, Washington's birthday though it was. The baking powder man raised the amount of the bills of goods which he had sold better than a whole can of his stuff could have done. I admitted the straight truth, that I had not yet been able to make a sale. And then I swore, not in a light-minded, chipper style of verbal trimmings, but a great, round, heaven-defying oath that I would sell a case of blue denim on that trip if it took me forever. We became dry with talk, and when the train stopped at Rivermouth, we went out to have some beer. It is good there, you know, pardon me. I forgot I was speaking to a lady. Well, we had to run to get aboard. I missed my footing, fell under the wheels, and the next thing I knew they were holding an inquest over my remains, while I, disemboweled, was sitting in the corner of the undertaker's table, wondering which of the coroner's jury was likely to want a case of blue denims. Then I remembered my wicked oath, and understood that I was a soul doomed to wander until I could succeed in selling that bill of goods. I spoke once or twice, offering the denims under value, but nobody noticed me. Verdict, accidental death, negligence of deceased, railroad corporation not to blame. Deceased got out for beer at his own risk. The other drummers took charge of the remains and wrote a beautiful letter to my relatives about my social qualities and my impressive conversation. I wish it had been less impressive at that time. I might have lied about my sales, or I might have said that I hoped for better luck. But after that oath, there was nothing for it. Back and forth, back and forth on this road, in chair number 13, to all eternity. Nobody suspects my presence. They sit on my knees. I'm playing in luck when it is a nice baby as it was this afternoon. They pile wraps, bags, even railway literature on me. They play cards under my nose, and what duffers some of them are. You, madam, are the first person who has perceived me, and therefore I venture to speak to you, meaning no offense. I can see that you are sorry for me. Now, if you recall the story of the Flying Dutchman, he was saved by the charity of a good woman. In fact, Santa married him. Now, I'm not asking anything of that size. I see that you wear a wedding ring, and no doubt you make some man's happiness. I wasn't a marrying man myself, and naturally I'm not a marrying ghost. And that has nothing to do with the matter anyway. But if you could, I don't suppose you would have any use for them, but if you were disposed to do a good turn, solid Christian charity, I should be everlastingly grateful, and you may have that case of denim at $72.50. And that quality is quoted today at $80. Does it go, madam? The speech of the poor ghost was not very eloquent, but his eyes had an intense, eager glare, which was terrible. Something, pity, fear, I do not know what, compelled me. I decided to do without that white and gold evening cloak. Instead, I gave $72.50 to the ghost and took from him a receipt for the sum, signed J. Billington Price. Then he smiled contentedly, thanked me with emotion, and returned to chair number 13. Several times on the journey, although I did not perceive him again, I felt dazed. When the train arrived at New York, and I, with the other passengers, dismounted, it seemed to me that a strong hand passed under my elbow, steadying me down the steps. 
As I walked the length of the station, my bag, not heavy at any time, appeared to become weightless. Story two. I believe that the parlor car ghost this walked beside me, carrying the bag, domain. whose handle still remained in the my other hand. Ghost. Indeed, once All or twice I thought down. I felt the, the touch of cold fingers of against friend, mine. Sarah Pine. Since then she I have no reason to, to suppose that the poor ghost is not at rest. For I summer. hope he is. She confessed but I she never expected nor wished for the blue denims. The next day, however, a dray belonging to a great so wholesale house backed up to our door and delivered a case of denims, with a receipted bill for the same. What was I to do? I could not go about selling blue denims. I could not give them away without exciting comment. So I furnished the cottage with them, and you know the effect on my complexion. Pity me, dear and but credit me, frivolous woman as I am, with having well saved a grave, soul at the expense of my own vanity. For pity's sake. My story is told. Mr. J. What do you think about it? And who is End he? of story he two. Sound interesting. Then I will tell you about him.